Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us. My name is Vanessa Langhurst. I'm the supervisor of circulation multimedia here at the Columbus State Community College Library. This is the kickoff of our diversity, equity, and inclusion speaker series. It's supported by the State Library of Ohio with federal funds from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We are thrilled to have Celia C. Peters speak with us today. Celia is a filmmaker and visual artist who creates spellbinding future stories about intriguing, authentic characters. She is conscious of creating stories that represent the world she knows, multiracial, multicultural, and multi-experienced. Celia has a newly released scripted podcast out called Domesticated, and we're now putting that in the link in the chat for you all to check out later. She's currently developing her Afrofuturist feature film Godspeed in partnership with Warner Media 150. You can see her concept video that is already live online, and we're also putting that link in the chat as well. At the end of Celia's presentation, there'll be some time for questions. You can unmute your microphones then or present a question by a chat. Okay, Celia, please take it away. Hey, okay. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, it's really, really great to be here with you today. And I appreciate you being here and sharing this time. Um, and I'm really excited to, to talk about Afrofuturism and also to talk a little bit about filmmaking. So let us dive right in. Um, Hey, hold on one second. I'm sorry about that um, delay. I want to make sure that I'm sharing my screen because I don't think I am. There we go. Okay. Please ignore all these tabs. There we go. Um, so my name is Celia C. Peters, and I am a filmmaker and a visual artist. And most of my practice lives in the world of Afrofuturism. So um, what is Afrofuturism? Uh, it is a phenomenon that has become a very big deal culturally the recent past. Um, it's actually been around for a little while in various forms. I think Afrofuturism kind of predates the label. The phenomenon predates the label, but here we are. And it's on the tips of a lot of tongues these days, but still a lot of people are not quite sure exactly what it is. So today we will find out. So Afrofuturism at its core is a way to explore the future from, from the perspective of Black people. And when I say Black people, that means Black people globally, not just Black Americans. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a global phenomenon, and it's a creative cultural movement that puts Black people at the center of our own futures, which in the past has not always been the case. It involves the process of exploring intersections of and with technology, science, nature, extraterrestrial life, interdimensional life, um, time, evolution, among many other things. Sorry to interrupt. Do you mind turning the music down just a tad bit? It's a little hard to hear. Sure. Oh, no, no, no. Could people not hear me at all? We, we could hear you, it was just battling you a little bit, you know. Okay, I'm sorry, it wasn't so loud on my end. Um, so what I said was that Afrofuturism is a cultural movement that puts Black people at the center of our own futures. So it, it's a process of exploring intersections of and with uh, technology, science, nature, extraterrestrial life, interdimensional life, time, evolution, among many other things. The term was first used in 1994 by a writer named Mark Derry in his essay called Black to the Future. And his definition 
definition was speculative fiction that treats African-American concerns in the context of 20th century techno, techno culture and more generally African-American signification that appropriates technology and prosthetically and a, and, and a prosthetically enhanced future. So since that time, since 1994, obviously this definition has expanded. It has morphed into something that is much bigger, much deeper, and also I think more flu much more fluid. Afrofuturism celebrates Black cultures from around the world and imagines how Black cultures and communities might live in the future. So we're going beyond the idea of just existing in the future. It's the idea of how might we live? How might we live knowing that we can, from the present, create our future? So for many people of the African diaspora, history has involved oppression and suffering through slavery, colonialism, and uh, racial injustice. Well, Afrofuturism flips the script on that. It's a new way to understand the state of being Black that is free from the terrorism and genocide oppression of the past. It allows for a fluidity of time and identity and culture, and it includes all aspects of diasporic and when I say diasporic, I mean from the African diaspora, which means everywhere in the world that Black people have gone from the continent. It includes all aspects of diasporic beliefs, expressions, which include magical realism, technology again, science, aesthetics and design, symbolism, science, math, astronomy, you know, and the different ways that those are embraced by Black people around the world. So the roots of Afrofuturism are found um, in spiritual beliefs that were born on the continent of Africa long, long, long ago. Um, these beliefs, you know, as time went on and we approached the modern age, these beliefs influenced Black creatives who brought new cosmic perspectives to their audiences. But first, I'm gonna talk about these roots a little bit. And, and I'm going to talk about three cultures that really sort of are reoccurring throughout Afrofuturism in various ways, in various places. Um, and sometimes it's elements of these cultures and sometimes it's much, much bigger, a much bigger presence. So the first um, culture I'll talk about is the Dogon people of Mali. And as you see here, Mali is in West Africa. And the Dogon had an ancient system of astronomy that dates back to 3000 BC. They created calendars, calculators, medicine, and pharmacology. But where, where their, their origin story is, is fascinating. Um, in their origin story, Ama was the supreme god, and Ama created the Nomo, who were hermaphroditic amphibious beings who came to Earth from the stars, from the Sirius B star system, which when the Dogon people, when the story originated, um, Sirius B, the star, uh, which you can see a little bit here, Sirius A is the dog star, which is huge, and it's the brightest star in our skies. Sirius B is much dimmer and smaller as we see. And when the Dogon created this, or well, when this origin story came to be, Sirius B was still not visible to, it, it's not visible to the naked eye. We had not yet seen it as a, as a species. Humans had not yet seen the star. Another group that are hugely um, influential, a culture that's hugely influ influential is that of the Yoruba people of Nigeria. And we see here in Nigeria is also in West Africa and it's on the coast. So the Yoruba culture dates back at least to the first millennium BC. Um, and their belief system is that life is a series of reincarnations. 
and that the physical and spiritual world are ruled by a sky god called Olumun, who owns the sky and everything below it. Communication between the hum between humans and the spiritual world is essential, um, and it happens through the re a relationship with with beings called Orishas. And Orishas are primordial, ancestral, nature-based divinities that the faithful worship and, and pay tribute to. And in the Yoruba belief system, um, there are, well, definitely nature is central. And that belief system also is the basis for Cuban Santeria, Haitian Vodun, and American Voodoo. And those obviously, you know, spread to other places through slavery and colonialism. And then the other, the other um, African culture that is hugely present in Afrofuturism is that of ancient Egypt. Um, the ancient Egyptians had a very complex spiritual belief system that was part of life. It was part of their life. And in fact, there was no word for religion because for them, there was no separation. Um, in ancient Egypt, there were deities of all levels, but gods and goddesses were definitely involved in the human world. And there was overall an eternal system or an eternal order of existence. So for the ancient Egyptians, their deities took many forms. And the Pharaoh, the almighty Pharaoh, was literally the bridge between the human and the divine world. So that's why Pharaohs were revered the way that they were, because they had this immense, this, this ability, you know, they were this bridge. So those, these cultures are really in the DNA of Afrofuturism. When you find them showing up in different ways, some ways very literal, and some, you know, maybe not so literal, um, but they're there, and so, and many times it's visual as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about. We're going to move into the 20th century and talk about how Afrofuturism came to be here. So 20th century Black artists um, who wanted really to be free of America's racial constraints were attracted to worlds beyond the here and now, obviously. Um, if you're in, you know, in the Jim Crow South, in the pre-civil rights era, in a time and a place where you feel oppressed, of course, your mind is going to go to a better place. And the vivid concepts and belief systems of these cultures were liberating. You know, it was a way to get around these barriers because no, no one can control your mind. So the, the jazz musician Sun Ra was really the catalyst for Afrofuturism in modern Black American culture. He was um, the pioneer, really, of a vanguard. So Sun Ra was born um, in 1914, his name was Herman Blount, and he was a musical prodigy as a child. But as a college student, he was at Alabama Agricultural and Mechanical University, and he described at that time being abducted by aliens. And he described having the experience of being taken off of Earth to Saturn. And for him, that experience changed his path. Um, he said that he received a message that he should leave school and do music and that his music would change the world. So he did that, he left school, but he also, he was already playing music, but he shifted from straight ahead jazz to the cosmic sound that really defines his career to this day. Like the Pharaohs, um, Sun Ra was a bridge connecting his audience to the freedom of the cosmos. And in 1974, he did a film called Space is the Place, which many of you probably have heard of. And in this, in this story, um, he, he rescues black people using music and transplants them to another planet where there's life with no racism. And 
the political message is really a reflection of how many people were feeling at the time. And you know, they felt that strongly about liberation that people would you know, be willing and happy to leave the planet. And Sun Ra, as you can see here, this is one of his album covers for the album Saturn Alien. Um, he wrapped himself in Egyptian iconography. And often, you know, the, the image of Saturn, the planet that he said he visited, visited reoccurs throughout his, his work. Uh, here we go, here he is. And this, this still is an image from Space is the Place. So as we move forward into the 20th century, um, we have other musicians who kind of take up this cosmic mantle. George Clinton and his band Parliament, um, along with his alter ego, Star Child, are probably the first ones that come to a lot of people's minds. But we also had trailblazing artists like LaBelle. Um, there's another artist named Betty Davis. Um, who used to be married to Miles Davis. She was a funk artist. And they had this very sort of cosmic glam um, presentation. Here we have uh, jazz musician Kamasi Washington, who is a contemporary artist who's making music now. And he's sort of taken up this mantle of Sun Ra, of this sort of cosmic presence and this music that has a very big, big sound. So science fiction itself, of course, is a genre of pure imagination. Anything is possible. And really the constraints are, you know, your, your imagination, literally. Um, and so when you combine that with this sort of these other motivations, you know, the, the, the drive for liberation and for freedom and, and to, to celebrate oneself, we have Afrofuturism. Sci-fi writers create worlds and characters that are whatever, however, wherever they want. And here we see a few characters that we've met along the way over the years. Um, sorry. And as with science fiction in general, with Afrofuturism, there are no rules. You'll find that some Afrofuturism you know, the world building is the centerpiece so that there's a completely new world that doesn't, that did not exist, that we don't know of. Sometimes people draw upon history to create futures in a very concrete way. They make those connections. Sometimes people start from the present. Writers and creators may start from the present and go out. Just like science fiction at large, some Afrofuturism is more technology based. Some of it is more sort of focused on life outside of this planet. It really is everything. And here we see um, a still image from Black Panther. So one of the other areas where Afrofuturism flourishes and has flourished, um, and arguably most strongly, is literature. Um, storytelling is a tradition that goes back millennia in African cultures. Um, and certainly is a tradition that lives in Afrofuturism. Afrofuturist writers use the power of the written word to create complex worlds where Black people are centered. They are literally world builders. And Afrofuturist literature has been essential in rooting this phenomena in the collective consciousness. So here I have a few writers, probably the most well-known is Octavia Butler, um, who was a writer who wrote, She believe, I believe she started writing in the very, very late seventies, but really through the eighties and nineties until her death, she died in early 2000s, I believe 2004. Um, she was writing and creating stories and she's done several series. She's done short stories and she, was an outlier when she was writing because she was a black woman writing in a in a genre where most of the authors, uh, most of the known authors were white men. And she created stories that were a reflection of, you know, a lot of times people talk about Octavia Butler's work being prescient. It's because the world that she was creating, um, the societies that she portrayed are very much like the societies 
society that we see now in the sense that there everyone is represented and everyone is is equal and i mean there you know i'm saying that with a big grain of salt we are equal but in terms of people's roles and their access in her stories everyone men women black white latino indigenous asian people were all, all sort of together in this place. And it was often more so a question of humans and non-humans, which really puts things in different perspective. Uh, um, Samuel Delaney is another writer who is, he's still alive and he was a professor at Temple, but he's a very accomplished and prolific writer who wrote stories that um, represented people of color, but also represented very strongly fluid sexuality. And so, um, that was also very different, you know, very, very different for the time when he was, when he started writing, for sure, in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, we have Nadia Korfor, who is a very well-known author. Um, we, there's another writer named P. J. L. A. Clark, who's also a very well-known author. And over here, there's an author named Cadwell Turnbull, who is um, West Indian. And he's, uh, you know, a bit younger, but he, and, well, I should say maybe a bit newer, um, but his work definitely reflects his Caribbean culture. You know, he's integrated integrated that into his sci-fi stories. And then we have Tomi Adiyeme, who is a Nigerian American writer, who is the New York Times bestselling author as well. And I would like to note that Tomi Adeyemi and Nadia Korfor, as well as Octavia Butler, all have work that is being developed for film or and or television right now. In the realm of music, we have uh, many artists who have introduced um, Afrofuturism or Afrofuturist ideas into America's psyche. And you know this idea of futurism, this idea of technology, because music and the way that we access music is very much affected and influenced by technology. Um, and in many ways, these, these artists create the soundtrack for Black futures. And I have um, here we have uh, um, Erica Badu, who is very much a sort of cosmic artist, in I would say more of a sort of crunchy way as opposed to a techie way. Um, here we have the producer. Flying Lotus, who is the actually the nephew of Alice Coltrane, who was married to John Coltrane. And so that whole family has obviously a tradition of this very cosmic and otherworldly sensibility, just very big ideas and concepts about reality and who we are as a species and what our world, where our world sits in the whole landscape of reality. Missy Elliott is um, a producer and an artist who's known to be an innovator. And her work is, is, is very technologically influenced. You know, a lot of her work was done with the producer Timbaland. And their sound, especially when their sound came out in the 90s, was very distinctive for that use of electronica and electronic sounds with a very, um, I would say African-oriented sort of polyrhythmic structure. And then um, this, this image is from a music video. This is Rihanna, believe it or not. Um, and she did a song that was from one of the Star Trek films. And so the whole video, the music video is set on this very distant land, a very distant world, I should say. I don't know what land it was, but if we think about the fact that sound is vibration, um, then, you know, in a very, very literal way, this music creates vibes that embody these otherworldly possibilities. And then we have film. So there's a very fast growing um, community that is literally flipping the script on science fiction film. Um, there are a number of black filmmakers who are exploring future stories that center black characters. Their work is intriguing, it's culturally rich, and these stories are speculative. You know, um, even when they draw upon the, the past, 
many times they're speculating about this a future. And there are stories, there's conflict, there's drama, there's, there's action all woven in there. Um, these films inspire imagination and explore Black futures without limits, um, without the limits of time, space, or reality as we know it. And then we have visual art, which is another way, another visual way that Black artists are expressing and, and sort of depicting a future. Visual artists illustrate unlimited possibilities for existence. They allow us to see meaningful, imaginative visions of unfettered Blackness with mind-blowing clarity. And their art reflects past, present, and future and everything in between. And just to make a note, going back, back to those cultures that I mentioned in the beginning, for a lot of, for those three cultures, the Yoruba, the Dogon, the ancient Egyptians, as well as many others on the continent, um, time is seen and it's, it's understood in a different way. Time is fluid and time can be simultaneous. So that past, present, and future are seen to be existing simultaneously. Right. So another another sort of manifestation or way that Afrofuturism is, futurism is increasingly um, being expressed is through style and fashion. Um, I think children, it's fair to say, children of the African diaspora are known for loving adornment. And there are many designers and stylists who are creating African-rooted aesthetics with future-forward vibes that really celebrate Blackness. Um, this, these eye-catching Black cosmic styles go back to our forefathers and foremothers. So here we have these two very funky hairstyles. So this guy obviously is from contemporary, you know, contemporary culture. But this hairstyle, which is called the Amasunzu, is a Rwandan hairstyle that was very popular in the early 1900s. And so when you think about this form, which to me just looks like uh, space, it, it just makes me think of space travel. Um, th this was very popular for men, a, a hairstyle for men. And there were corresponding styles for women, but these were existing in the early 1900s. So this photograph is from, uh, I believe it's 1910, I think this photo is, but it's definitely early 1900s. And so the other layer to this is that these looks have meaning that reflects their connection to culture. It, it, the, the meaning that is imbued in these styles is coming from culture. So Afrofuturism is represented in shapes, silhouettes, and we're able to sort of synthesize timelessness. And then we have, um, and, and I think this is a very, very exciting aspect of Afrofuturism. We have these cultural stewards who are really introducing Afrofuturism into life, into the lives that people are living on an ongoing basis every day. Afro, Afrofuturist cultural speaks, speak, uh, sorry, Afrofuturist cultural stewards are taking representation to the next level. They go to society's leading edge to build consensus and conscious coalitions to improve Black life from an Afrocentric perspective. So that what that means is improving conditions in Black life with an eye to the future. So Ingrid Lafleur is an activist and artist who is from Detroit. Um, she's now living in Johannesburg, but Ingrid is very involved culturally, both as a curator, but also as sort of a, a community builder. Um, she's involved with bringing black, the blockchain to black communities. She's also involved with sort of looking at how societies are organized, communities are organized around resources. We have Black, black Quantum Futurism, this organization, which is really um, Rashida Phillips and Kame Ayewa, they are based in Philadelphia, and they are 
really sort of arts centered, but it's a very strong arts activism. And actually they both um, earlier this year finished a residency at the CERN Institute in, in Switzerland. So the where the Large Hadron Collider is, they did a, a CERN does an artist residency every year. And so they were looking at time from the perspective of theoretical physics. And so when I was talking about these African cultures that have a different understanding of time, this is what they were exploring, but from a, from a modern to future perspective. As well, there is the Center for Afrofuture Studies, which lives at the University of Iowa, of all places, in Iowa City. And um, CAF is a very dynamic, artist-driven center organization that offers residencies every year. I had the pleasure of doing one. And in those residencies, artists are given space to expand some aspect of their practice, but they're also required to do a public facing presentation. And so to engage the community there in Iowa City as well. And then um, last but not least, there is the Afropunk Festival. I'm trying to move these photos here. Um, the Afropunk Festival, which originated in Brooklyn, New York um, in 2008. And the, the origin of the festival was a documentary called Afropunk, which was done by a man named James Spooner. And James Spooner was a guy who was a punk. He was also black. Um, he was a punk musician. Um, and he grew up feeling like he was sort of isolated. He felt like he was the only black kid who was into this music and into this energy and into this aesthetic. And then he discovered, as many of us did, and I include myself in that, that we're not the only ones. And so he did this documentary kind of, you know, featuring people, talking to people around the country who had had a similar experience. And the music festival was born. When it was born, it was a smallish um, DIY festival that happened in Brooklyn. And it has since grown enormously. Um, and this, these are sort of the core, core beliefs of Afropunk, no isms, no sexism, no racism, no age, ableism, ageism, no homophobia, no fat phobia, no transphobia, no hatefulness. And so the festival is one that has, um, at this point, really big headliners, um, but it's also spread to other parts of the country and of the world. So outside of Brooklyn, the festival also happens in Atlanta, I believe Chicago and Miami. And then it also happens in London, Johannesburg, and Paris. And I think they're still they're still growing. So basically, places where Black people are, that that's where Afropunk is going. And they describe themselves. I just want to say as the other Black experience, which I think is um, is pretty much on point. So Afrofuturism is really about freedom and imagination. It's this nexus of freedom and imagination with an understanding that, you know, there is a, for, for people who are in this realm, there is a love of blackness. You know, there's not really any space for self-hatred here. And there's also the understanding that things will be what, whatever you decide and make them. And I will say that Afrofuturism has also, I believe, inspired, I don't want to say that, so it's inspired, but I'm sure like other cultures were also thinking about their own futures, other, other marginalized cultures. So we have Latinx futurism, we have indigenous futurism, and we have Asian futurism, where, where these people of these races and cultures and ethnicities are creating their own future stories that are based in their own cultural beliefs and often going back to antiquity um, because you know these cultures have very long long histories and so again this idea particularly i would say with indigenous culture um, the idea of time being fluid is something that's instrumental and if we look at the aztecs and the incas we see the same the same idea. 
So Afrofuturism is really, in many ways, a pathway to power. It's a pathway to power through liberation of the mind. And it's a view of, of life, of reality, of Black futures from the bigger, from the big picture perspective. It's where Black people envision themselves in their true greatness, seeing ourselves in our true greatness, diving into all of the possibilities that the future offers. New discoveries, new struggles, new achievements, new glory, but on our own terms. And here we are. So I definitely encourage you, if you're interested, to explore these stories. Because for Black people, you know, this is really a, another means of self-discovery. It's a, it's a, it can, Afrofuturism can be a starting point for you. It can be entertainment, but it also can be something deeper. And for people who are not Black, the same. You know, just in a way that, you know, Black people enjoy the stories, the traditions, the belief systems of other cultures is the same thing. So um, please do explore. And, and I'm happy to say that there's more and more and more for us to explore. Um, OK. So I know that we're coming to time. Um, I guess I would ask Vanessa and Nathan, do we have any wiggle room with time, with the ending time? Absolutely. Um, maybe we can just be mindful if, if other people have to jump off that side. Maybe sure. We can go over. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I'd like to I'd like to go into the film, and that's a much shorter presentation. But I just want to go into that a little bit, and then I can still leave time for questions at the end. Great. That sounds great. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So I wanted to talk about filmmaking, filmmaker life. And I'm aware, you know, this is, this is being presented so generously by, um, by CSCC, but, and many of you may be students, but some of you may not be students and that's fine. This pertains to everyone, to anyone looking at this, anyone who may be interested in filmmaking. And also, I have a belief that we're all students. I mean, I think that's a goal, you know, for our, as long as you're alive, you should be learning something. That's, that's my personal belief. So I wanna talk about filmmaking first in big terms. Filmmaking at its most basic is the craft of visual storytelling. Um, you know, here we have Ava DuVernay, who is a, a writer, director, and producer. Here we have a camera, which captures the, the visual images. And here we have an editor who, and this is a vintage, this is a vintage photo um, of film. You know, he's actually literally cutting the film. Filmmaking is collaborative. And this is, I cannot um, state the, I can't overstate the importance of this. Um, filmmaking takes teamwork. Uh, it just is, that's, there's no way around it because there are many roles, there are many people's work that go into making a film. And so as a filmmaker, as an aspiring filmmaker or someone who wants to get started or someone who has started, it's really important to find your tribe. Find your tribe because you're not gonna be doing it alone. You could be the most talented person in the whole universe, but guess what? You're still gonna need other people to help you make your film. So my advice um, to you, whether you're in film school or not, is to school yourself on the process. And what I mean by that is learn the big picture of how film is made. It's really important to understand that this is a process that it takes time and it can look very different. You know, it's, if you think of the process of making a cake, different people do it different ways. You know, some people, it's very complex. Some people get a box mix and it's very easy, um, but it's still the same basic process. 
So you need to understand what this process is before you try to go in. And trust me on that. Like, even if it feels like, well, why do I need to know this or know that? You do. Because when you settle on to what it is that you really love about filmmaking, that specific thing, it's going to be that much richer and you're going to be that much more empowered if you understand the context in which you are operating. So I would suggest that you dive in, you know, especially if you don't really know sort of what what you're most interested in, or you may not know what you, where you feel your strongest, dive in and try different roles and figure out your focus. There's no ticking clock ever. As long as you're alive, there's time to do it. And there's no one thing, there's no one role that's better or worse. Every one of them, as I said, is absolutely necessary. It's from producer, director, writer, actor, costume designer, um, sound recordist, gaffer, grip, to production assistant. We, everyone is needed. So one of the ways that if you're interested in getting involved, um, you know, one thing that you definitely want to keep in mind is this whole idea, and I think this is good advice probably for life, but this uh, giving and receiving, you know, things, it, it, tend to work out best when they're reciprocal. And I think that, you know, obviously in life, but in filmmaking, it's no different. And one of the ways that you can um, really get your feet wet and get into the mix is volunteering to learn. Now, I'm not advocating that you allow someone to exploit you. That's not what I'm advocating at all. However, if you are trying to get experience and you don't really have a track record, and probably particularly if you're not in film school, um, helping by volunteering to help others on their production, you're helping yourself because you're learning. That's your education right there because you can ask many filmmakers, the bottom line is the best way to learn to make film is making film. It's just, that's point blank. Um, there's things that you can learn in the classroom, but you until you actually do it, you're not really learning it. And once you do it, you will learn in a way that you will not forget. And part of becoming a filmmaker is learning the technical, you know, the technical things, of course, but also part of it is learning how you want to do things. Because there are many ways to make a film, as I said before. So really, a lot of it is figuring out what is it that works for you? What style works for you? What stories are you wanting to tell? So when you, when you make yourself available to other people, um, then you give yourself the opportunity to learn. And also, if you're volunteering, also, um, a lot of times, as opposed to if you were applying for a job, no experience, it's going to be kind of tough. But if you come to a situation as a volunteer with no experience, people tend to be a lot more flexible because they need help. And so you see here in this photo, there's somebody shooting and then there's somebody holding the cable. Well, you know, you're looking like, oh, well, I, yeah, I held this cable for five hours on the shoot. And that seems like a, maybe a drag. I don't know. But the bottom line is this person who's shooting would have had a really rough time of it without somebody holding the cable. So this is, again, it's important. And then the other thing I wanna say is just the idea of having integrity. That is super important. I mean, I think, again, in life, you wanna show up with integrity. But when you talk about filmmaking, you know, if you're working on someone's film, that is their baby, you know, it's important to them. And whatever your passion project is, imagine that. That's how important it is to them you want to treat it as such. It doesn't have to be your baby, but have integrity. And, and a lot of that is just honesty. So if you're not able to do something or you don't have time or you're not going to be you know, free at that time, just say it because it's better for that person to hear the truth so that they have realistic expectations, they can move on, than to be disappointed and have a disruption because you weren't able to make it or you know, et cetera. So just do it. We've heard this before, but I don't think this can be said enough. And it certainly is true with filmmaking. If you have an idea for a story, 
just do it. Figure out how, figure out what story you want to tell and start telling it. It may start with writing it. And then if you have a smartphone, then you have a high definition camera in your phone. Most smartphones now shoot 4K. And there are lots and lots of accessories that you can get online on Amazon or eBay or other places where you can really augment what your phone can do. And in fact, there are iPhone film festivals now. I mean, there's there's a lot that you can do. And I this is like a golden era in that sense, because we, you know, most of us have phones. So one of the things you want to do is connect with collaborators. And when I say collaborators, I mean other people that you know who are around you. They could be fellow students. They could be coworkers. They could be friends. They could be people that you met on meetup, on a meetup. I don't know, but connect with them and then support each other because that's how community is built. That's how community is created from people supporting each other. And then make your thing, make your thing, you know, reach out to people. Um, reach out to people that you know you can depend on and and make it happen. And you know, when you write a story, you write a script, there's lots of resources where you can figure out how to write a script. And your first script is not going to be your best script. That's true of anyone and everyone. But that's okay. You know, if you're learning, you got to start somewhere. And it could be as you know, it could be a minute film, and that's legit. Write your script, figure out where you're gonna shoot. You're gonna shoot on your phone. Okay, do you need lights? Do you need a microphone? Do you need to have sound? Are you gonna have dialogue or will it be a silent phone with music? All of these things are sort of the things that you wanna figure out for yourself and then do it. And if it doesn't work out the way that you wanted, do it again, do it again, do it again. And that's what learning is. And I guarantee you, Every step, every try is going to teach you something. So watch and learn. So I mean that very literally. Um, watch lots of films. Watch films. Read scripts. And even and you can find scripts online. Sometimes you can find them at the library, but you can also find them online. Um, many times for free, actually. Many PDFs of scripts out, especially films that have already been released. Um, but even more valuable is if you read the script of a film that you watched and watch it again after you've read the script. You will learn, you will learn how, what happened from the page to the screen. Study your film crush. And when I say film crush, I don't mean who you think is good looking. I mean, whose work is, are you drawn to? Whose work do you really admire? Look that person up, look at their story, read their bio, figure out how they, what their pathway was to get to the point where you discovered them. And, you know, in some cases you can reach out to them depending on who they are. I mean, if it's, uh, you know, if it's Ava DuVernay, it might be a little difficult to get to her at this point. But if it's somebody else who's not so high profile, but might be equally accomplished, you might be able to get through to them. You know, don't give up. And, and at the end of the day, the worst thing that can happen is that someone says no, or their assistant says no, they don't have time. Just move on and reach out to somebody else because the whole thing is you wanna learn. And if people, I think generally love to talk about what they love to do. So a lot of times they'll be more open than you think. And then the other thing is read books and articles. So there are lots of books about filmmaking. There are lots of articles about filmmaking, about screenwriting, about directing, about producing, about acting. So all, there's a lot of information out there. Just access it and dive in. So I um, have a couple of clips of stuff that I've worked on um, that I'm gonna show and I think I'll just, um, let me see where we are in time. Okay, I think I can squeeze these in. So this, this is a short film that I did called Roxy 15, um, which is kind of a short, it's an Afrofuturist thriller, techno thriller. My rule. Ms. Jones Software provides a user with a meaningful virtual learning experience. My focus is to interface between the brain 
and the digital. The possibilities here are endless. Hello, I'm Ambrose. You've entered Mind Expansion Level 1 program. Program creator, creator Roxanne P. Jones. show you also a trailer from a short that I did in Columbus when I was living in Columbus and this short was um was definitely an experiment for me it is a silent film that has a score and so I collaborated with a producer who is in Columbus her name is Moxie Martinez and um we met and we you know, she created a score that in many ways is a big character in this film. And the film is about um, someone who, who comes here from another planet, from another world, and he encounters someone um, who's also from his world, but who's not here for the reason that he thinks. <laughs> So the post-production for that film was done at the Wexner Center um, for the Arts. I received a, res a post-production residency for that. And um, at, all of the talent is local. And, you know, I shot it in Columbus locations. And again, that was one of those things of community, of like connecting with collaborators and, and doing it. So finally, um, this is my feature film project. Uh, this, oh, this, I'm sorry, this is a, a clip. For, this is a, the concept reel. And um, this project is called Godspeed and it's now in development with Warner Media 150. And um, this concept reel is, is really sort of laying out the story from the perspective of the lead character. Something has got its teeth into me, and it just won't let go. Has it ever happened to you? You think you're on top of things, and all of a sudden you're being consumed, devoured? That's what's happening to me. The next uptown train is now running. It's this thing I'm working on for a client. It's definitely the biggest the most ambitious project I've ever done. It's complex, technologically complex. I don't even remember when I started. Feels like it's always been somewhere in my head. And I love it, but it terrifies me. I've got to finish. I've got to tie all these threads together, all these calculations. I can almost see the shape of it. It's beautiful. The thing is, the closer I get to finishing, reality feels less and less real. The ground keeps shifting underneath me and I'm losing touch with something. And my family, they love me, but they can't fix this. But, well, 
my brother, my baby brother, he knows something. But even saying that sounds insane. He's only seven years old. I don't know why this means so much to me, but I'm not gonna lie. It's everything. It is the single most important thing in my life. I've never been so scared and so exhilarated. Hallelujah! I have no idea what's happening to me. I'm a high achieving science nerd, have been all my life. So it would be very ironic if the thing that destroys me is the algorithm I created. Godspeed. So that um, concept reel is, the film has not been done yet. It's in development. And the concept reel is meant to just give a sense of the story sort of the big picture, using footage and things and images from other places. And so here's me, if you'd like to stay in touch. Um, and I don't, um, I don't know, uh, well, first of all, um, there are links that are available. So if there's something that kind of went by quickly or maybe the signal was not so strong where you are. Um, Vanessa and Nathan have the links for the, the media that's in the presentation. So you can take a look and certainly, you know, I'm here artisticfreedomltd.com and artisticfreedomltd at gmail.com is my email. If anyone has any questions, anything you wanna ask me about, if there's, you know, some advice or some way I can point you, please let me know, I'm happy to, happy to do that. So I wanna say Julia. thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Let me let me jump in real quick. Um, you're amazing. That was amazing. You. Um, your presentations are gorgeous. They're incredible. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Oh, you're um, very welcome. Yes. Yeah, so um, yes, if anyone has any questions um, or comments for Celia, you can go ahead and unmute your microphones. Um, if you feel more comfortable putting it in chat, feel free to do that as well. Um, we do have a question that came through chat already. Um, it is when and what sparked your interest in film? Um, so uh, two things. One is that when I was a girl, when I was growing up, one of my grandfathers had a Super 8 camera and he used to, you know, do like family films. And then, um, of you know, my our whole family, but especially his grandchildren. And so then my grandmother, um, like they, my grandparents would have these viewing parties for us and my grandmother would make popcorn and it was just a lot of fun, but it was also very surreal to see yourself on screen in a moment that had already passed. So I was really fascinated with that. Um, and then fast forward um, as an adult, I think my interest came from in writing because I've always loved writing. And, I'm, and then I, as an adult, as a, as a college student and then leaving college and going out into the world, I really loved independent film. And so I watched film all the time, all the time. And then um, when I was, right before I went to graduate school, I had a friend who was an attorney who, he wanted to get out of sort of corporate law and do entertainment law. And he suggested that I write a screenplay. And he said, I think you, you know, I think you can do, you'd, you'd be great at it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I got to do these GREs first. And then, and then I did, you know, um, and so by the time I moved to New York, I had this script under my belt. And when I started grad school at NYU, all of my extracurricular activities were film related. And I did, you know, I volunteered, I tried to get on productions and do whatever I could to learn because I was already in school, in graduate school for psychology. So I needed to learn a different way. So that was really, that was, it was a multi-layered process. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Celia?
Um, Gary, I have a question. Is the idea of Afrofuturism to explore from a global perspective of Black people with the idea that there's no restraint going forward, that there's no limits? Yes, very much so. Okay. Very much so. And it's not, it's not from the perspective of uh, being blind to issues or problems or obstacles, but the idea is sort of having an understanding that you're not going to allow yourself to be limited. Like your path forward, you will not allow to be limited by those things. So whatever that, whatever that takes and whatever that means. So it's optimism and, and drive. Optimism, drive, and realism, I think. You know, I think it's a it's an idea of realistically look understanding that in the past, a lot of what prevented people from actualizing to the fullest extent was their own belief in what they were hearing. Hearing that they were inferior, hearing that they couldn't do this or they couldn't do that and believing it. And once you no longer believe that, then the game changes. Well, I haven't listened to Sun Ra in 40 years, but I'm going to listen to him again tonight. And thank, you for, <laughs> thank you for reminding me. Sure, sure. Crystal, go ahead. Do you have a question? I don't have a question. I just really wanted to uh, thank you, Celia, for sharing your talent and your work uh, with me. I am a huge fan of Parliament Funkadelic, um, <laughs> Earth, Wind and Fire's all in all uh, album um, and, and the concepts, right? And the content um, of those. But I really, really appreciate seeing you, you know, as a uh, some black girl magic, right? Sharing your magic with us. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you sharing your time. Absolutely. We have a question in the chat, Celia. Are there any specific books, stories, movies, music that help inspire you? I know we talked a lot about the artists in the presentation. I'm curious if there are any artists in particular that have been part of your journey. Um, yes, there is. There are many. Um, one of the artists, I've, so Alice Coltrane is one. So even though Alice Coltrane is no longer with us, um, I discovered her after John Coltrane who I've loved since college. And Alice Coltrane was sort of on a different, a little bit of a like similar track, but different. And so her music is very expansive and really cosmic. Um, I meditate to it a lot, but also it's just very rich and a great soundtrack. Um, in the more, and you know, sort of coming to the present, there's a, a lot of electronic artists who are out there. One that comes to mind is a guy named King Britt, who, um, he also performs or records under the moniker Flowston Paradigm, which is F-H-L-O-S-T-O-N Paradigm. Um, and that music is electronica, but it's also very, it's rhythmic, but it's also very future forward. Um, in terms of film or scripted content, there's a lot, there's, you know, it just seems like there's more and more. And I feel like there's a lot more mainstream work that is incorporating these, some of these ideas. One story that comes to, well, obviously Black Panther, right? Um, but I also want to mention that there is a film festival, a virtual film festival that I curated, which Vanessa and Nathan have the link to. Um, it was done by allarts.org, which is a branch of WNET in New York, which is a public uh, television station. And I curated a festival called Blackness Revisualized. And that uh, festival has 10 films shorts and features um, that are Afrofuturist films from around the world. So there are 10 films from five different countries. And there are lots of really great stories there. And that inspires me because they're all very, very, very different. Um, very different. Uh, so that is, that is, you know, I love discovering new stories and new, new ways of telling these stories. Because if you think of the diversity of black people, you know, from, you know, there are 
Black people from Africa, there are Black people in America, in the Caribbean, in Europe, in South America. Um, and so every one of those groups has a different, different pathway, different cultural understanding, different communities. Um, and so there are that many stories, if not more. In terms of like recent things that have been on, uh, yeah, I'm, my, of course, this is like when you get the question about where should we go for dinner and then you suddenly can't think of any restaurants. That's how I feel right now. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to send some titles. Um, I would say just, I would check out, cause these are not exactly, th these are not necessarily done by black creators, but I think that the presence of black characters is very much in step with the ideas, the ideas of Afrofuturism. Um, something like The Expanse, which is a very multiracial, uh, has a very multiracial cast but the story itself is not about race. It's about some other concerns of people in the future. And it really has to do with people being from Earth, from Mars, or from the asteroid belt. And within each of those communities, they're completely mixed racially. That, I mean, it's set very, very far in the future. So there are bigger fish to fry, let's put it that way. Um, there's also a really great film on Apple Plus called Swan Song, which has Mahershala Ali and Naomi Harris and Glenn Close and Aquafina. Um, that's a really, it's a really mind blowing story actually. It's beautiful, it's a beautiful film, but it's really mind blowing because it's, you know, it raises, it poses this kind of existential question that I believe at some point we will probably have to deal with. So there's that. And then there was also a series on, I think on Apple Plus called Foundation, um, which is based on stories by, Isaac Asimov, um, but it kind of has this twist, you know, in terms of who's represented. So I think those are those are great as well. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, the next Black Panther. Um, I had an opportunity to do a panel, and I had Hannah Beachler on, who's the production designer for Black Panther. So she literally was responsible for creating the world of Wakanda visually, creating that visual world. And so she's very excited about the next film. So if she's really excited about it, I'm really excited to see what comes. And so we have that to look forward to as well. Thank you. That was great. That was great answers. Um, we have another question through chat. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm a huge fan of sci-fi and would be interested to hear your thoughts on Lovecraft Country if you've had the chance to check it out. Yes, I have. Um, I thought that I, so I watched the series on my own and then I watched it with a, a group, a sci-fi group. Um, and we did these weekly screenings. And, you know, I have to say, I was not really familiar with Lovecraft himself. And so I was coming into it sort of, you know, just interested, you know, by what I, the visuals that I saw. I thought it was really fantastic. I mean, I thought that we saw not only these, I mean, obviously there's like, it's set in the past. So we do have this kind of historic, these historical um, issues that were very real and, you know, to whatever extent are still very real. But at the same time, within that historical setting, there are these depictions of characters that are just, we don't really, we have, especially before that, had not seen very often these very fantastical things and, seeing, you know, a little girl who was so interested in comics, seeing this woman, her mom, who was so interested in science and like, the, you know, having these things that are not, you know, unfortunately are not often explored in black characters, particularly black women characters or girl characters. Um, seeing, you know, these, these the, the storyline with Ruby, and and the person that she her her i mean her lover but who you know who wasn't who she thought you know it just was very like i don't want to give anything away for those who haven't seen it um as well as this, this sort of this group that comes together to 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 on this quest i mean i thought it was i thought it was really great and visual and just a real sensory like you know kind of explosion you know which is that at the end of the day, that's great storytelling. 
when you're gripped week to week and you can't, you got to figure out, you, you got to see what happens next. That's great storytelling. So, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Celia. Thank you again for sharing all of your knowledge. Um, and thank you all for staying a little later <laughs> for this. Thank um, you. We'll be sending an email out and um, we'll have a survey, but we'll also include all the links of um, the things that Celia has talked about and shown. So um, thank you all again. Celia, you're the best. Thank um, you and, so much. Yes. And everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Have a great one.